Chapter 3, The World's Greatest Dinosaur War Ever. I couldn't believe it. The door opened in the middle of the math class, and the principal pushed the older, raggedy kid in. Mrs. Cordell said, Boys and girls, we have a new student in our class starting today. His name is Rufus Fry. Now I know you will all help make, her, make Rufus feel welcome, won't you? Someone sniggled. Good, Rufus, say hello to your new classmates, please. He didn't smile or wave or anything. He just looked down and said real quiet, Hi. A couple of girls thought he was cute because they said, Hi, Rufus. Why don't you sit next to Kenny? And he can help you catch up with what we're doing, Mrs. Cordell said. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I'd wanted my personal saver to be as far away from me as he could get. I knew that when you put two people who were going to get teased a lot, and they were close together. People didn't choose one of them to tease. They picked on both of them. And instead of picking on them the normal amount, they picked on them twice as much. Mrs. Cordell pushed the new kid over to the empty seat next to me. Kenny, show Rufus where we are in the book. I watched the new kid sideways, and he said, Kenny, I thought they said your name was Poindexter. The class cracked up. A part of the country, from his country style of talking, part of the laughter was from laughing at me. I could tell that even Mrs. Cordell was fighting not to break out laughing. Though he was looking friendly when he said, said this, I knew, I kind of knew it had to be teasing because whoever heard of anyone's mama name, giving them the name like Poindexter. When he sat down next to me, I tried to imitate Byron's death stare, but it didn't work. Because the kid smiled at me real big and said, My name's Rufus. What are we doing? Times tables. Oh, that's easy. Need some help? No, I said. And I scooted around my chair so all he could do was to look at my back. The kid was real desperate for a friend because even though I wouldn't say much back to him, he kept jabbering away at me all through class. When lunchtime came, he followed me outside right to the part of the playground where I did sit and eat. He forgot about bringing a lunch, so I gave him one of my mama's throat-choking peanut butter sandwiches and let him eat that at least half of my apple. He really was a strange kid. He only ate half of the sandwich and folded the rest up in wax paper. And when I handed him the apple, he even ate the spots that were you could see my teeth had been. Huh. He didn't even wipe it the slob off at first. Ugh. And man, this kid could really talk. He was jabbering a mile a minute, saying stuff like, Your mama sure make good peanut butter sandwich. And how come these kids are so darn mean? Then he had something that made me get all funny and nervous inside. He said, How come your ears ain't looking in the same, or your eyes aren't looking in the same way? I looked to see if maybe this was the start of some teasing. But he looked like he really wanted to know. He wasn't staring at me either. He was just kind of looking down and kicking the dirt with his raggedy shoes. It's a lazy eye. I stopped kicking the he stopped kicking the dirt and said, "Oh, don't it hurt?" No, actually. He said, "Oh," and then he kicked the dirt a little bit more and hollered, "Oh boy, look at how fat that there is! What? Do you see that squirrel?" He asked me, and he pointed up the tree across the street. That sure is one fat, dumb squirrel. I looked at that squirrel. It didn't look fat or dumb to me. It was a regular old squirrel sitting on a, on a bench, on a branch, chewing on something. How come you think it's dumb? What kind of squirrel sits out in the open like that with folks all around him? That squirrel wouldn't last a two seconds in Arkansas. I'd have picked him off easy, like as nothing. The kid pointed the squirrel like he was, uh, his finger was a gun and said, Bang, squirrel, stew tonight. You mean you shot a gun before? Ain't you? You mean you really ate squirrel before? Ain't you? Uh, a real, real gun. Just a twenty-two. How's a squirrel taste? Oh, it tastes real good. You mean you really shoot them with real bullets and you really eat them? Why, why else shoot them? Real squirrels, like that one. Not the fat and stupid, not 
not that fat, not that stupid. I guess all the fat, stupid ones got already have been got already. Since I've been born, that's all left in Arkansas is skinny, sneaky ones. I think that Michigan squirrels is worth two Arkansas ones. You aren't lying. He raised his hand up and said, I swear to God. Ask Cody. Who? The little shrunk up version of the new kid was standing by himself up against the fence that runs along Clark watching us. The kid waved him over. His little brother came running over. The big one pointed over to the squirrel. Cody, look at it. Look at it. Look at there. Cody laughed and said, Whoo boy, that sure is a fat squirrel. Think you could pick him off from here? Cody pointed his finger like a gun and said, Oh, bang, squirrel stew tonight. I couldn't believe this little kid had shot a gun too. You shot a real gun? Oh, just a 22. With real bullets? The little one looked at his big brother to see why I was asking all this stuff. It seemed like they were trying to be patient with me, like I was a real dummy or something. The older one said, Tell him. Yeah, it was real bullets. What else you gonna shoot out a gun? I still didn't believe them. But the bell rang and lunch was over and I knew, I know, he didn't think I noticed. But the big kid gave his little brother the other half of my sandwich. I guess both of them had forgot about lunch. This saber stuff wasn't going anything like I thought it was supposed to. Rufus started acting like I was his best, his friend. And in the morning, on the bus, he'd always come sit next to me. And Mrs. Cordell put his regular seat next to mine in school. And every day at lunchtime, he followed me out to the playground and ate half my second sandwich and sneaked the other half to, his, to Cody. He even found out where we lived. And he started coming over every night about 5.30. I didn't mind him coming over to play because both... Both our favorite game was playing the little plastic dinosaurs that I had, and you could really have you couldn't really have any fun playing by yourself. That was because someone had to play the American dinosaurs, and someone had to play the Nazi ones. Rufus didn't even mind being the Nazi dinosaurs most of the time, and it was okay playing with him because he didn't cheat. He didn't try to steal my plastic monsters. The only th other the, the only other guy I used to play with was JJ LJ Jones, but I quit playing with him when a lot of my dinosaurs started disappearing. I got about a million of them, bef but before LJ started coming over, I had two million. It's kind of embarrassing how LJ got them from me. At first, he'd steal them one or two at a time. I asked Byron what I should do to stop him. Bye said, "Don't sweat it, punk." The way I figure it, one or two of them stupid little monsters ain't a real high price for you to pay to get someone to play with you. But LJ wasn't satisfied with just one or two. I guess he wanted to raise a raise. So one day he said to me, You know, we should stop having these little fights all of the time. We need to have one great big battle. Yeah, we could call it the world's greatest dinosaur war ever, I said. But I got to be the American. I should have known. I should have known something was fishy when LJ said, Okay, but I get the first shot. Most of the time, it always took a big fight to decide who was going to be the Nazis. I started setting up my dinosaurs, and LJ said, oh, This ain't right. If this really is the world's greatest dinosaur war ever, we need more monsters. You should go get some, the rest of them. He was right. If this is going to be the famous battle, we needed more fighters. Okay, I'll be right back, I said. This wasn't going to be easy. I wasn't allowed to take any all my dinosaurs out at once because Mama was afraid I'd lose most of them, especially because she didn't trust LJ. Every time he'd come over, she'd tell me, You watch out for that boy. He's a little sneaky for my taste. I had a plan, though. I'd go, up, I'd go upstairs and drop the pillowcase I kept in my, all my dinosaurs in out of the window. And it was so, wasn't so was so stupid that I'd drop them down to LJ. I'd drop them out of the other side of the house and then run around to get them. My plan were perfect. After I went and picked up my pillowcase, I sent 
my dinosaurs and LJ set up his di- Nazis and we started to battle. He took the first shot and killed about 30 of mine with an atomic bomb. My dinosaur shot back and got 20 of his wrath or with a hand, a hand grenade. The battle was going great. Dinosaurs were falling left and right, center. We had a great big pile of dead dinosaurs off to the side, and he kept shaking more and more reinforcements out of the pillowcase. And in the middle of one of the big fights, LJ said, Wait a minute, Kenny. There's something we forgot about. I was ready for a trick. I knew LJ was going to try to get me to get away for a minute so he could steal a bunch of my monsters. And I said, What? These dinosaurs been dropping atom bombs on each other. I think. Think about how dangerous that is. How is it dangerous? LJ said, look. He made one of his brontosauruses run up the pile of dead dinosaurs. And when it got two steps past, it started shaking, twitching all over, and fell over on the side, dead as a donut. LJ flipped him on the dead dinosaur pile. I said, well, what happened to him? It was radioactiveness. He got, we got to hurt, bury the dead before they infect the rest of the live ones. Maybe it was because we had such a great war going on and I was kind of nervous about who'd win. But this stupid st- stuff made sense. So instead of digging each one a couple of hundred dead dinosaurs, a grave, we dug a giant hole and buried the radioactive ones in it. Then we put the big rock on t- so that no radioactivity could leak out. This really was the world's greatest dinosaur war ever. We fought and killed dinosaurs for each for such a long time that we had to make more, more graves with two more big rocks on top of them. LJ finally pulled the, the trick I knew he was going to do, but he did it in so, it so cool that I didn't even see it coming. Kenny? You ever been out over to Banky and Larry's Dun- Dunn's Fort? LJ knew that I hadn't. Uh-huh. I found out where it is. Where? You want to come see it? Are you crazy? There ain't there. This is Thursday night. They up at the community center playing ball. Really? Well, if you're too scared, I knew that was the worm with the hook in it, but I bit anyways. I'm not scared if you aren't. Let's go. I, so I figured the trick would be come right in where I kept a real good eye on LJ while we were to put the monsters back in the pillowcase. When we were done, I sneaked a look out at his back pockets because I know that's where he stole the dinosaurs from. He put them back there or in his socks. From the way his pockets were sticking out, it looked like he had Tyrannosaurus Rex and the Triceratops. I couldn't tell how many he had in his socks. But I figured it wasn't too bad, a price of pay for me as much fun as we'd had. LJ was talking a mile a minute, then even got some books with with naked ladies in it. Have you ever seen a naked lady? Yeah, lots of them I had too. Byron had borrowed one of those lots of Nazi ma- magazines from Bumphead's library. I knew LJ didn't believe me though. For some reason, if you were famous for being smart, no one ever thought you looked at a dirty book. LJ said, You gotta be in the house by seven, don't you? Yeah. Okay, we better hurry before it gets too late. After I'd sneaked the dinosaurs back into the house, we ran off towards Banky and Larry Dunn's secret fort. It wasn't until nine o'clock at night when I was in bed that the bell went off in my head. I'd forgotten all about the radioactive dinosaurs. I put all my tennis shoes, I got up at night with a reading flashlight, climbed out the back window, and went down the tree to the backyard. I got into the battleground and saw three radioactive graves. But when I moved the rock, the first thing, the first one was dug a little bit down. It didn't hit one dinosaur, not one dinosaur. The second grave was empty too. I didn't even move the rock on the third one. I just sat there and felt really stupid. I couldn't help thinking about Sunday school again. I remember the story about how a bunch of angels came down and rolled away the rock, and that was in front of Jesus' graves to let him out to go to heaven. I think it took them three days to push that rock far enough so he could squeeze out. My dinosaurs weren't even in their grave for three hours before someone rolled back the rock away. 
Maybe it was a lot easier for a bunch of angels to get a million dinosaurs to heaven than it was to get a real savor of the whole world there. But I wished they'd given me a couple more hours. But I th was just making excuses for myself for being so stupid. I know if a detective had looked at these rocks, he wouldn't have found a clue that single angel being of the single angel being there. But I bet a million bucks that if he'd seen that, that the rocks were covered with a ton of L.J. Jones fingerprints. I never played with L.J. again after that. So playing with Rufus got to, got to be okay and a lot better. Not to have to worry about getting stuff stolen when you were with your friends. And it was a lot better not spending half the time arguing over who's going to be the Nazis and dinosaurs. I was wrong when I said... That me and Rufus being near each other all the time would make people tease us both twice as much. People started leaving me alone and going right after Rufus. It was easy for them to do because he was kind of like me. He had two things wrong with him too. The first thing wrong with Rufus was that the way he talked. After he said, hi y'all stuff on the bus, he got to be famous for it. No matter how much he tried to talk in a different way, people would not, wouldn't let him forget what he said. The other thing wrong with him was his clothes. It didn't take people too long before they counted how many pairs of pants and shirts Rufus and Cody had. That was the easy to do because Rufus only had two shirts and two pairs of pants. And Cody only had three shirts and two pairs of pants. The on, they only also only had one pair of blue jeans that they switched on and off. Some days Rufus wore them and some days Cody rolled up the legs and put them on. It's really funny how something as stupid as a pair of blue jeans can make you feel real, real bad about what's happened to, to me. We had been sort of secret friends for a couple of weeks before people really started getting on, on him, them about not having a bunch of clothes. Me and Rufus and Cody were on the bus right behind the driver one day when Larry Dunn walked up to the seat and said, Hey, country cornflake! I notice how... You and your little brother switched off them pants, and I know fr Fridays is your day to wear them. But I was wondering if the same person who gets to wear the pants gets to wear the drawers that day, too. Of course, the whole bus started laughing and hollering, and Larry Dunn went back to his seat real quick before the driver had a chance to tell anybody the secret he knew about Larry's mama. I looked over at Cody. He had the blue jeans on today. He was pulling on the waist. And checking out his underpants. Hmm. Maybe it was because everybody was else was laughing. Maybe it was because Cody had such a strange look on his face. But when he peeked at his underpants, maybe it was because I was glad that Larry hadn't jumped on me. But whatever the reason was, I cracked up too. Rufus shot me a look. His face never changed, but I knew right away I'd done something wrong. I tried to squeeze the rest of my laugh down. Things got real strange. Instead of Rufus jabbering at me all the time at every minute at school, he scooted around his seat so all I could see was his back. He didn't follow me on the playground either. And he acted like he didn't want my sandwiches anymore. Ever since Mama had met Rufus, I told her about sharing my sandwiches with them. And she had been giving me four sandwiches and three apples for lunch. When I saw him and Cody weren't going to come under the swing for lunchtime, I set the bag with the sandwiches and apples on the swing set. The bag was still there when, I, when the bell rang. They quit sitting next to me on the bus, too. And Rufus didn't show up that night to play. After this junk went on for three or four days, I sneaked the pillowcase of dino, full dinosaurs out and headed over to where Rufus lived. I knocked on the door, and Cody answered, and I thought things might be okay because Cody gave me a great big smile and said, Hey, Kenny, you want to want to talk to Rufus? Hi, Cody. Just a minute. Cody closed the door and ran back inside, and Mama later, Rufus came to the door. Hey, Rufus, I thought you might like to play dinosaurs. It's your turn to be the Americans. Rufus looked at the pillowcase and then back at me. I ain't playing with you no more, Kenny. How come? I knew, though. I thought you were my friend. I didn't think you was like all them other people, he said. I thought you was different. He didn't say stuff like that when he, were, he was mad. He just sounded real, real sad. He pulled Cody out of the doorway and shut it. 
Rufus might as well have tied me to a tree and said, Ready, aim, fire. I felt like someone had pulled all my teeth out with a pair of rusty pliers. I wanted to knock on the door again and tell him I am different, but I was too embarrassed, so I walked the dinosaurs back home. I couldn't believe it, how sad I got. It's funny how things could change so much and you wouldn't notice. All of a sudden, I started remembering how much I hated riding the bus, and all of a sudden, I started to remember how, how lunchtime under the swing set alone was not very much fun. All of a sudden, I started remembering that before Rufus came to Flint, my only friend was the world's biggest dinosaur thief, L.J. Jones. And all of a sudden, I remember that Rufus and Cody were the only two kids in the whole school, other than Byron and Joey, that didn't automatically look at, I didn't automatically look at sideways. A couple of days later, Mama asked me to sit on the kitchen with her for a while. How's school? Okay. I knew she was fishing to find out what was wrong and hoped it would take, wouldn't take would take her too long. I wanted to tell her what I'd done. Where's Rufus been? I haven't seen him lately. It was real embarrassing, but tears exploded out, out, out of my face. And even though I knew she was going to be disappointed in me, I told Mama I'd hurt her Rufus's feelings. Oh, did you apologize? Sort of. But he wouldn't let me talk to him. Well, you give him some time and you try again. Yes, Mama. The next day after school, the bus pulled up at Rufus's stop and Mama was standing there. When Rufus and Cody got off the bus, Hi, Mrs. Watson. And gave her a bit there in their big smiles. The three of them walked towards Rufus's house. Mama put her hand on Rufus's head while they walked while they'd walked. Mama didn't say anything when she got home, and I didn't ask her, but I kept my eye on the clock. At, at exactly five thirty there was a knock and I knew who it would be, and I knew what I had to do. Mama and Joey were in the living room, and when they heard the knock, everything got real quiet. Rufus and Cody and I were standing on the porch, smiling a mile a minute. I said, Rufus, I'm sorry. He said, that's okay. I wasn't through, though. I really wanted him to know I am I am different. He said, shoot, Kenny, you think I don't know why you think I came back. But remember, you said it's my turn to be the Americans. People started moving around the living room again, and I guess I should have told Mama that I really appreciated her for helping me find my get my friend back, but I didn't have to. I was pretty sure she already knew.